Hello! Today, we will do a video to go through events in the Roman Empire after Constantine's death and before Theodosius became the last sole emperor of Rome and officially split it into two halves, east and west. When we reach that point, our narrative will focus almost exclusively on the east. As the title suggests, this video is going to be a bumpy ride. But before we delve into today's topic, I want to add a few things I didn't get to say last video about Constantine the Great, mainly his succession and legacy. Feel free to skip ahead if this disinterests you. After the death of Crispus, Constantine was left with his three sons with Fausta, Constantine II, Constantius II, and Constans. His succession plan was to revive the Tetrarchy for reasons I cannot comprehend. He spent so much of his life defeating rival Tetrarchs, and now he wanted to leave his sons in the very same position? But anyway, since the Tetrarchy requires four emperors, he threw in his nephews Dalmatius and Hannibalianus as well, with Hannibalianus being a fifth wheel. To rectify that, Constantine decided to bequeath the unconquered Persian Empire to him, which was why he planned to campaign against the Sassanids in the last video. His successors were not very keen on power sharing though, as we will soon see. Obviously, Constantine's most impactful legacy to the world is his boost to Christianity. But that's not all. This man also brought the clean shave back into fashion for Roman emperors. Constantine was very egoistic about his impressive achievements. Once he cleared out his competitors, he brought the entire Roman Empire another period of relative peace and stability, something that was becoming less and less common with each passing year. So what do emperors feeling good about themselves usually do? Or the building projects, of course. He left us with the Ark of Constantine, the Basilica Nova, and the Colossus of Constantine in Rome. Though only parts of the Colossus remain, he also built churches, such as the Church of St. Peter in Rome and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. His grandest building project is without a doubt, Constantinople, and that's where our narrative resumes today. Constantius II, upon receiving news of his father's passing, rushed to Constantinople and buried Constantine in the Church of the Holy Apostles. Then, he ordered every male Constantinian relative of his, including Dalmatius and Hannibalianus, to be disposed to maximize the control over Rome he and his brothers share. Soon, Constantine II, Constantius, and Constans were the only three rulers of the empire. However, some younger relatives survived this massacre. Gallus, Nepotianus, and six-year-old Flavius Claudius Iulianus, who will become important very soon. Now, Constantius ruled over the Eastern Empire, Constance the Central Empire, and eldest brother Constantine the West. Constantine acted as the legal guardian of underage Constance. With these arrangements made, Constantius headed east to face the Sassanid king Shapur II. However, in 338, tensions rose between Constance and Constantine. Big Brother thought he deserved North Africa as the eldest, and Constance complied at first, but as soon as he reached 18, the conflict grew big. In 340, Constantine invaded Italy, but was ambushed by Constance and Aquileia and was killed there. Constance then ruled the entire Western Empire. He led some successful campaigns against barbarians in the early years of his rule. While Constantius was busy battling with Shapur, the throne of Constance was usurped by Magnentius, a commander from Gaul. In 350, Magnentius murdered Constance while he was hunting near Helena. It was said that astrologers prophesied Constance would die in the arms of his grandmother, and he did. Helena was named after Saint Helena, his grandmother. Constantius and Shapur quickly made peace and set off to settle their own problems. Constantius hurried west to take care of Magnentius, and Shapur went east to deal with the Hunnic threat. Constantius appointed his cousin Gallus as Caesar in the east before facing off with Magnentius. I will spare you the details of the civil wars I must cover in this video. <sighs> Slate Imperial Rome for you. Anyway, after three years of bloody fighting, Constantius won the Battle of Mos Seleucus, and the loser Magnentius committed suicide. Did Constantius enjoy any peace as the Sol Augustus? Nope. He had to deal with Gallus, as he doubted the Caesar's loyalty and governing skills. Gallus got rid of the messenger sent by Constantius in 354, so Constantius had to lure Gallus to him. Gallus was arrested and interrogated, blaming all his misdeeds on his wife, Constantina, the sister of Constantius. The Augustus, enraged by the accusations against his sister, 
first ordered Gallus to be executed, but then changed his mind. However, the second order wasn't received on time, and Gallus died anyway. Now, Constantius only had one male relative left, Julianus. After crushing another usurpation by another commander in Gaul, Constantius had enough. He needed help dealing with the never-ending threats to the empire, so he elevated a member of his family to Caesar again. This time, he chose the right man. Let us now introduce Julianus, who would successfully defend the Rhine against the barbarians, while Constantius was kept busy in the east. Flavius Clodius Julianus, the brighter and younger brother of Gallus, was appointed Caesar on 6th November 355. Julianus was an extraordinary figure, for he would be remembered as a deeply cultured philosopher emperor like Marcus Aurelius. From the age of seven, he was taught by the finest intellectuals in the East on matters of theology, philosophy, and much more. Julianus loved learning and had a soft spot for Neoplatonic philosophy. He was studying in Athens when Constantius called him to Mediolanum and made him Caesar. The inexperienced Julianus was then sent to Gaul with a small number of troops to campaign against Germanic tribes in 356. There, he was doubted by many, but he proved them all wrong by emerging victoriously time and time again against the barbarians, despite the many difficulties caused by treacherous subordinates. Julianus studied intensively about warfare when he was assigned this task, and as a result, he beat back the tribes and ruled Roman Gaul excellently for a few years. In 361, Constantius, put in a tight situation by Shapur, requested that Julianus send his men east. The men were not happy with this order, so they proclaimed Julianus Augustus instead. Julianus tried to refuse this offer at first, but was forced to take the title. When Constantius caught wind of this, he was furious and marched west. Sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? A Caesar in the west being forced to be Augustus, invoking the wrath of the Augustus in the east. <coughs> Constantine and Galerius. The situation seemed dire, as it seemed there was another civil war at hand, but alas, Constantius only reached as far as Mamsucrani before dying of illness, but deep down, Constantius knew Julianus would be the only logical and competent heir to his throne. He announced his will and passed away. Constantius II may not have been the most pleasant man, but he did his best during his turbulent reign to fight back the Persians and barbarians. May he rest in peace. Julianus was now emperor of Rome. He gave his cousin a proper burial in the Church of the Holy Apostles alongside Uncle Constantine on 11th December that year. And then he was free to pursue his ambitious reforms for the empire. Julianus had been a pagan since his 20s, and he idolized the old emperors of Rome. He ruled in their fashion, styling himself as princeps instead of divine autocrat. Clearly, his ideas were not at all popular with the Christianized population of the East. They called him Julian the Apostate for his promotion of pagan culture, which I think is rather mean. Literally every emperor before Constantine was a non-Christian. Would you call the first emperor of Rome Augustus the Apostate? Julianus did not care for their insults, but he did need legitimacy, and a major victory against the Sassanids is a surefire way to secure the loyalty of the Eastern army. So he left Constantinople for Persia in 362, making a short and unpleasant stop at Antioch along the way. The Persian campaign in 363 did not go well, however. The same problem that plagued Julianus in Gaul happened again. Incompetent subordinates. He entrusted 30,000 men to his cousin Procopius, who did not come to his aid when things went bad for the Romans. While retreating towards Samara, the Persians attacked the rear guard. Julianus rushed to confront the menace and encouraged his troops, forgetting to don his breastplate in the haste. Deadly mistake. He was struck by a spear and died after a few days of struggling. Julianus, the last pagan emperor, was initially buried in Tarsus, but later his body was moved to the Church of the Holy Apostles with the other Constantinian emperors. Shortly after Julianus' death, his bodyguard, Flavius Ioannus, was hailed as Augustus. Ioannus, reigning for only eight months, made peace with Persia on disgraceful terms and issued edicts on religious tolerance before dying in 364 from either mushroom or carbon monoxide poisoning. The army then elected Flavius Valentinianus as emperor, who we know as Valentinian the Great. Valentinian picked his brother Valens as co-Augustus in the Eastern Empire, while he took on the West, where barbarian threats were more numerous. Valentinian was a competent general, and he spent the rest of his reign fighting various tribes along the Rhine and the Danube. 
While campaigning against the Alemanni in 365, Valentinian received news that Procopius, the one who followed Julianus to Persia, revolted in the east against the Valens. He decided to head east and aid his brother, but didn't do it, because he felt his priority was to defend the western borders. Luckily, Valens defeated Procopius at the Battle of Theatera eight months later and executed the usurper in 366. As I said, Valentinian's reign mostly consists of endless clashes with barbarians, and he was faced with something never seen before in 367, the Great Conspiracy. Multiple barbarian tribes, the Picts, Franks, Saxons, and more, coordinated and took over Britannia. The Emperor sent Count Flavius Theodosius the Elder to deal with the menace after his first two generals failed. Count Theodosius launched effective campaigns and read Britannia of the invaders in just two years. Recognizing Theodosius' competency, Valentinian made him the Magister Equitum and sent him to put down a revolt in Africa, which he accomplished in 374. Valentinian sadly died the following year. He received an invoice from the defeated Quadi tribe, whose attitude angered him so much, he had a stroke and died. Valentinian would prove to be the last strong emperor of the Western Empire. His sons, Gratian and Valentinian II, succeeded him, with Magister Peditum Merubaut's influencing them both. Valens, on the other hand, finished the Aqueduct of Valens in 373, while dealing with endless hordes of Goths seeking asylum in the Empire for migrating Huns. He didn't manage the crisis very well. As a result, the Goths flooded in through the Danube and warred against the Romans, winning the final showdown at the Battle of Adrianople in 378. Gratian tried to send troops to help his uncle, but they were retained by Merobouts to fight the Alemanni. This delay in reinforcements caused Valens and almost all of his men to be slaughtered by the Goths in one of the worst military disasters the Romans ever faced. With Valens dead, Gratian became the senior Augustus. He knew he couldn't stop all the Goths roaming free in the empire on his own, so he appointed the son of Count Theodosius. Theodosius asked Co Augustus to help him. They did their best to mop up the mess of Adrianople, but the 380s was when religious intolerance inside the empire intensified. Bishop Ambrose of Mediolanum started opposing pagan and Jewish worship and gradually influenced the emperors into doing the same. In 380, Gratian and Theodosius issued the Edict of Thessaloniki, along with the young Valentinian II, which made Orthodox Christianity the sole state religion of the empire, allowing persecution of heretics, especially Arians. These religious conflicts had devastating impacts, Romans clashed against one another, and many statues, temples, books, and artworks were destroyed. In short, it was a hot mess. Gratian became unpopular in the West and was killed in Lugdunum by men of a new usurper, Magnus Maximus, in 383, leaving his half-brother Valentinian as the Western Augustus. Theodosius, however, recognized the usurper as his imperial colleague in the West due to Ambrose's intervention. Valentinian and his mother remained in Medellanum until Magnus invaded Italy in 387, but that's a story for later. Next time, we will cover Theodosius I's rise to power and the rule of the rest of his dynasty. Their reign will have a rough beginning, with the sons of Theodosius being utterly useless, but things get better eventually. So, bye for now! If you enjoyed the video, have questions, or would like to correct a mistake I've made somewhere, feel free to leave a comment. Also, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Thank you.